Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our fourth episode of The Lead. And I am thrilled to have a friend of mine here today. Please join me in welcoming Wall Street Journal reporter, Catherine Clark, to our show. Uh, you have all probably read her work in, in the Ma mansion section on Friday, where she writes about the world's most luxurious properties, celebrities, and billionaires, as well as market trends. Thank you so much for being with us today. Kathy, welcome to the lead. There you are, Kathy. Hi, thanks for having me. Great. Nice to see you. There we go. Um, so, Kathy, you've been a real estate reporter at The Real Deal, The New York Daily News, and now The Wall Street Journal. How did you choose real estate as your subject? Uh, I did not choose real estate as my subject. I feel like it chose me to some degree. Um, I was, you know, straight out of journalism school, 22, 23, looking for a job, looking for a visa. And I wound up at the real deal and thought, you know, maybe I'll do this for six months. I'll find something I really want to do. Real estate sounds boring. And within a couple months, it just sucked me in. Um, I remember the editor in chief of the real deal at the at the time and still is Stuart Elliott, he told me, you're going to find that real estate is a way to talk about so many different things, you know, wealth, power, influence, politics, design, architecture, you know, there's so many different ways into this subject that are so interesting. And so it never gets boring, you know, it's just there, there's never a dull day. So I, I got hooked. Yeah, there is never a dull moment in real estate, that's for sure. Well, our agents and properties have appeared in the journal many times over the years, but not every property makes the cut. What makes for a good real estate story that would land in your column? Give us some tips. <laughs> okay, I'll give you all the, the secret sauce. Um, I would say there are, you know, multiple categories of great story, you know. Um, Number one for us is always price point. You know, we want to know about the most luxurious homes, the most expensive homes, the most wealthy people, because that our readers just eat that stuff up, you know. But even if you don't have a super expensive listing, there's so many other ways, I think, uh, to make it interesting. Like the history, the history aspect of listings is really interesting to us. I mean, we've written about, you know, listings that are only a few hundred thousand dollars or only a, you know, less than a million dollars because they have a really compelling historic component, you know, maybe some super interesting used to live there or, you know, a historic event happened there. Um, you know, maybe it was Imelda Marcos's apartment. She used to keep her shoes in the closet. There are so many ways to make something like this interesting. And then uh, I would also just say character, you know, if, if someone has an incredibly interesting human interest component, you know, maybe it's been owned by the same family for a hundred years and it's been passed on through five or six generations and each generation has had a different story in it. You know, just anything that you would find interesting to tell your friend, we would find interesting. Well, what would you say is the biggest change you've seen in residential real estate over the last few years? Social media, for sure. Has, I mean, I think it's changed my job as much as it's changed broker's jobs. I mean, we are getting so many of our stories from social media. We're making connections to sources through social media. And I'm sure it's the same with the brokers. They're finding buyers that way. They're marketing listings that way. So I would say uh, social media, YouTube, you know, the way the whole business has moved online is just a change even from when I started writing about real estate 10, 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, social media is so vast and it's a different way for everybody to connect today. And so it seems like you really have to be there in some capacity uh, in order to have, a, you know, a real presence. Um, yeah. Well, COVID has changed the way that we live and the way that we work. Uh, what areas of the country do you think are benefiting from the shift from a real estate perspective? So many. I mean, we, in the year after COVID hit, we've written 
stories all over the country. I mean, I think for in terms of ultra luxury that the market that we really saw explode was South Florida. We wrote so much about how the tables had turned completely for the market in Palm Beach and Miami and things were just flying off the shelf down there at these record sums. You know, all these financial folks from New York suddenly realized they didn't need to be at their desk all the time. And they started opening offices in West Palm Beach and all just migrated there en masse. And there, you know, there became this big question mark about whether they were ever going to come back. Um, but I would say also just like even secondary cities, like, you know, Denver, Phoenix, I just wrote a big story about um, Bozeman, Montana, and tons of New Yorkers and people from, you know, Seattle and San Francisco moving to Bozeman. So I would say it's, you know, all these places that offer a quality of life, like maybe there's a city, maybe there's mountains, maybe there's a beach. Um, and, you know, people didn't think they'd work there before and now that they can work remotely, those markets have opened up to them. Or are you surprised by any of these emerging luxury markets that you, is there anything that caught you totally off guard? I mean, the Montana one caught me a little bit off guard. <laughs> I definitely didn't think we were going to see major New York executives moving to, you know, Montana <laughs> and working from there. And, and Wyoming. Um, but it like and Wyoming was has had a big turnout too. A lot of people, I have a really good friend who packed up and moved to Jackson Hole. And she's there now full time with her family, left New York City. It sounds pretty good to me to be able to like snowboard or ski or something right after work. I mean, that doesn't sound bad. No, it sounds great. I mean, there's, there's you know, pluses and minuses. Um, so what are your thoughts, Kathy, on New York City's comeback now that we are starting to turn a corner in the fight against COVID? I would say on the whole it shocked me how quickly things came back i mean the fact that new york was completely shut down and was one of the only cities in the country that grind to a complete halt it's just incredible to me how quickly things turned around and you know i get the olshan report with everyone else on a monday morning and i was you know opening it going wow um over the last few months yeah the intensity of the comeback I mean, everybody, I think New Yorkers, we, everybody expected that there would be a bounce back, but the level at ha how it sort of came alive and the, and the intensity of uh, the numbers, you know, we, none of us really expected it to be at this level. I mean, it's, we're all pleasantly surprised to see that people like are tripling down on New York City. So that's been a really good thing for everybody. Um, what do you have a most memorable person or property that you've ever covered that you can share with us? Oh, I have so many. Uh, <laughs> let me think. I would say there are a couple that really stand out. Uh, there was a, a couple, um, I want to say they were from Texas, and the guy had founded this company called uh, The Gas Fans, uh, and it got its name because it used to be called like you know, large fans incorporated or something. And he said people would call and say, are you the guys that sell those big ass fans? And so he changed the, the company <laughs> name to that. And then he sold it for like hundreds of millions of dollars to some private equity firm or something. And then went, you know, home shopping. And we, he sort of, him and his wife allowed us to kind of follow them around as they went on their home search. And they went to see, you know, JLo and A-Rod's apartment. And they went to see, uh, a townhouse that was owned by the Forbes family and they went to see Lance Armstrong's apartment and they just gave us their unfiltered, no holds barred truth telling about what they really thought of all of them. And it was just really entertaining. That sounds fascinating. Um, yeah. The other one I'd say was I, I have written a lot about this guy in LA who was building this $500 million house and he was kind of like a party boy, playboy type um, kind of you know, overspent building this $500 million house. And then we sort of documented the unraveling of it. And it was super interesting. Well, you, Kathy, are working on your own book right now. And uh, you're taking a little break. Can you tell us a little bit about what your book is going to be about? Yeah, it's about the rise of Billionaire's Row in New York. So 
it's basically charting the development of, oh. you know, all these buildings that we've all read so much about. So, you know, Central Park Tower and 157 and 111 West 57th and 220 Central Park South and talking about the, you know, the, behind them, the developers, the architects, the financiers, you know, the triumphs and tribulations and disputes oh. along the way and um, just really getting into the backstory of how these buildings, you know, ended up on the skyline. What that sounds like a great book. When are you expecting to have it finished? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm supposed to. <laughs> I'm supposed to be filed to my publisher in January, and then I will come out sometime after that. But so everyone should wish me luck. Say your prayers. Okay. <laughs> well, we're excited. Uh, you know, when your book comes out, we're excited. Everybody, I'm sure, will read it. You're a great journalist and you keep us uh, in the loop on great stories and Brown Harris Stevens is always present. So thank you for that. And thank yeah. you for joining us today. It was great to just have you here uh, and hear a little bit from you about your experiences and what you're seeing. So thank you so much, Kathy. Thanks for having me. Okay, we'll see you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye, take care.